Next up is Larry Polk. Larry is a partner in the Atlanta office of Sutherland, Aspill, and Brennan. Larry represents broker-dealers, investment advisors, insurance companies, banks, and accountants, and con concentrates his practice in the areas of securities litigation, securities arbitration, commercial litigation, and SFC enforcement actions. Over the past 25 years, Larry has tried numerous cases through award or verdict and has defended individuals and firms in dozens of FINRA arbitrations throughout the country involving sales practice issues. Earlier this summer, Larry successfully defended an investment advisor in a FINRA arbitration against a claim seeking $31 million in damages arising from a discretionary account that invested primarily in CDO tranches. We all know how tough those, we, those can be. His experience in regulatory matters includes representing broker-dealers and individuals in enforcement proceedings, advising clients, and performing special compliance audits. Larry will discuss FINRA, FINRA's new suitability rules. Larry? Thank you, John. Uh, I'm going to be speaking this morning about um, a topic that all of us are very concerned about, and I'm sure that it has become a major focus in your, your practices, um, and that is the, the new suitability rules that have been adopted by FINRA. Uh, as you know, uh, the new suitability rules went into effect uh, July 9th, so we've got about two months of experience now in uh, evaluating the rules, adopting the rules. We haven't seen too much in terms of their application in arbitration or court. Uh, the basis for the new rules, you've got uh, Federal Rule 2111 on suitability, Rule 2090, the new Know Your Customer Rule, which is basically a, um, uh, uh, an amendment or modification to the old Rule 405 under the uh, NYSE rules. And then you've got three regulatory notices uh, that evaluate and, uh, and interpret these rules. And the most important of those, I would uh, tell you, would be Regulatory Notice 1225, which I'm going to be talking about quite a bit this morning. Now, in our uh, papers um, that we have uh, in the book that each of you have, we have an excellent article that my partner Brian Rubin and I prepared on the suitability rules. And that really gives you a lot of background in terms of the nuts and bolts of the rules. This morning, I'm going to be talking not so much about the particulars of the rule, but rather how I believe that these rules are going to be interpreted and implied in the context of arbitrations. Uh, now, based upon my reading of these rules, I think that we're going to see four areas uh, of novel theories that are going to be asserted by the claimants uh, and their experts. And those four areas are claims uh, being asserted by non-traditional customers, uh, the second is going to be the argument that some language in Regulatory Notice 1225 on best interest somehow creates a new fiduciary duty that applies to the relationship with our public customers. Uh, the third is going to be uh, what are called hold recommendations and how that new uh, area of the, uh, of the regulations uh, is going to be used to try to create theories of liability. And finally, I'm going to talk about reasonable basis suitability and how that's going to apply to claims, especially relating to training of financial advisors and cross-examinations that we're going to see of our financial advisors uh, in arbitration. I want to follow up on, on John's comments this morning that arbitration uh, in this day and age is more, more often than not, it's a knife fight. Um, and the reason why it is a knife fight is because, unfortunately, the claimants uh, over the past couple years and their council uh, and their organizations really have kind of dictated uh, the rules and regulations that are being applied in arbitration. If you look at the most recent statistics, uh, 76 percent of arbitrations uh, are currently being heard by all public panels. So we've lost our industry, our industry arbitrator uh, in virtually all the cases that are now being filed and I think that over the next year or two you're going to see industry arbitrators becoming a, a, essentially a dinosaur in arbitration practice. We have a lack of case law interpreting FINRA rules and the SEC rules. Uh, Joe just mentioned uh, uh, application of churning. Well, the law that we apply on churning is based in large measure upon decisional law that dates back to the 1970s uh, when folks bought and hold IBM and held it into an, an, an account. So this notion that uh, you can have churning just based upon six times turnover is really an anachronism 
dating back uh, 20, 30 years. So we have a lack of decisional law. Claimants come before panels and they actually tell arbitrators not to apply the law. They tell arbitrators ignore the law and instead do equity. I'm sure we've all heard that if you've been in an arbitration. We are limited now by Rule 12504, which says that you can't file motions to dismiss unless it's a very clear-cut case of a failure to properly identify a respondent. So what that means is that we cannot file a motion to dismiss no matter how uh, egregious uh, or unwarranted the claim is until the close of the claimant's case. And I don't know if your practice has been like mine, but for the most part in arbitration, by the time the claimant closes its case, the only uh, witness to be left to be heard is our expert. And typically the, the arbitration panel says, we understand your motion, let's hear the rest of the evidence, and then we'll decide the case. Uh, at which point in time you kind of lost the momentum for a motion to dismiss. What matters most when we look at these rules, what really matters most is not what I think or what you think uh, about these new rules. It's how three public arbitrators are going to interpret these rules and apply it to the relationship between you, your financial advisor, and public customers. And the final statistic I wanted to talk about uh, to follow up on John's comment that we've got 5,000 cases being filed this year. What's really scary about that is that according to FINRA's recent statistics, there's only 3,500 public arbitrators in the entire nationwide arbitration pool. So now that we've eliminated our industry arbitrator, just look at the numbers. You're going to see the same arbitrators over and over and over again, especially in smaller jurisdictions. I don't know if you have had cases when you get outside of large metropolitan areas, but typically that arbitrator list that you get, it's the same names over and over and over again, and that can be very scary. The other area I wanted to talk about is the role of experts. Claimants experts, in, for the most part in arbitration, are an abomination. They come before arbitration panels, and now we don't have an industry arbitrator to be a check in many of these cases. They come before arbitration panels and they opine about the rules are without having any knowledge, with any notion, with any real training uh, about what the rules are. They base their experience for the most part, uh, you know, these people, they say they were a branch manager 20 years ago and somehow that creates expertise, but it doesn't. In arbitration, we don't have the filter of Daubert. We don't have the filter of a judge being a gatekeeper. For the most part, these experts are being allowed to testify, and some of the, the testimony is just unbelievable. Here's something from a case earlier this year, an actual cross-examination of a claimant's expert. I asked him, and I used the term black swan event. Uh, he kind of had a puzzled look on his face. I said, do you understand what, what a black swan event is? And he said, I saw the picture, but I don't remember black swan event in terms of finance. No. So that kind of gives you an idea of the expertise, and by the way, that's a picture of John Hodgman, who's not a, a real expert, but plays one on The Daily Show. So let's get into uh, the four areas that I, I believe that we're going to see new theories of liability. Uh, and the first is non-traditional customers. Now, if you look at the FINRA rules in terms of who a customer is, FINRA gives a uh, very um, uh, unhelpful guidance. The definition is, quote, a customer shall not include a broker or dealer, which basically tells you nothing. FINRA rules should only apply to relationships between a broker dealer and its customer. And the case law in this area is fairly well defined from a number of district court decisions, especially over the past year or two, and that is a customer has a direct relationship with a firm. In other words, a traditional relationship where a customer opens up a brokerage account, you've got a new account form, you've got all of the information there, and that establishes the relationship. The new rules, though, under uh, Regulatory Notice 1225, under Answer 6, says a customer could include an informal business relationship. And the suitability rule could apply even to recommendations to a potential customer. Now, a number of cases I've had, I think one of the, the real areas that, that creates so much liability in the fall are dads standing around uh, the, the, the uh, football field uh, on Friday nights talking about investments they've made, uh, stocks they would recommend, and you have to be very careful now uh, with your financial advisors that they don't mention a specific stock to a potential investor, to a potential customer, because you may find yourself being dragged into arbitration by a customer with whom you have no customer relationship, no documentation, but somebody's going to come in and say, 
I talked to so-and-so, he told me this is a good stock, I should buy it, I lost money, now broker-dealer, you're responsible for that informal uh, uh, recommendation. And the last point that I want to make here, which is a tangential issue to this, is that under the new suitability rules, it now covers recommendations for both investment-related or securities-related and non-security uh, recommendations. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you make a recommendation to a customer, for instance, to sell a security and buy insurance or vice versa, or to buy a product that's not typically a, a security-related product, such as an equity-indexed annuity, then the broker-dealer can be on the hook uh, for even losses for that non-security uh, that, that has been recommended. So that's an important point to remember. Next is this issue of best interest, and there's been quite a bit of discussion uh, both uh, by the plaintiff's commentators uh, and in the financial press about what best interest means. Under the case law, and this is something that we're all very familiar with, under the case law, with the exception of California and my state, Georgia, a non-discretionary commission-based account does not create any type of fiduciary duty. And that's pretty good black letter case law that we've always relied upon. Under Dodd-Frank, under Section 913, the SEC was charged with the responsibility of evaluating whether to adopt a uniform fiduciary standard that would apply to investment advisors and broker-dealers. And the language in Section 913 says that broker-dealers shall act in the best interest of the customer with respect to the entire relationship. But 913 has not been adopted. The SEC has recently stated, as, as, as recently as this week, Chairman Shapiro said that that is not a, a priority item for the SEC, and it's very unlikely we're even going to see rulemaking with respect to a uniform fiduciary standard until 2013. Furthermore, if there's a change in the administration or a change in the SEC commissioners, we may never even see this rule being adopted. So if there is no uniform fiduciary standard. There is no best interest that applies to the entire relationship. The problem, and where we're seeing a lot of the chatter, is from language in Regulatory Notice 1225, Answer 1, which says a broker's recommendations must be consistent with his customer's best interest. Now, there's nothing unusual about that, and there should be nothing stunning about that type of, of language. Of course, with any suitability recommendation, the broker is supposed to be acting in the customer's best interest. You're making a recommendation that's consistent with the, investment, with the investor's investment objectives, strategies, financial circumstances. But the claimants and their, their experts, I can tell you, are going to seize upon that particular uh, uh, language and going to say, well, this creates a new best interest standard. And if you read that language very carefully, it's very clear it doesn't. Once again, it only applies to recommendations. It doesn't apply to the entire relationship. And what the claimants are going to try to do is to try to impose upon broker-dealers a principle-based regulatory scheme rather than a rule-based scheme because it's much easier to try to waffle on a principle in terms of explaining it to a panel than actually having to look at black letter of a rule and explain that. Ultimately, and this is a very important point for anyone that practices in this area, ultimately there's two firewalls that you can cite, and I, I recommend that you put this in your back pocket any time you go into a hearing, you blow these up, you put these into your pre-hearing briefs. Section 15 of the 34 Act says that nothing in the section shall require a broker to have a continuing duty of care or loyalty to the customer after providing personalized investment advice. There is no continuing duty to monitor. Regulatory Notice 1225, Answer, uh, answer 7, even FINRA says that even if it's a recommendation, there is not an ongoing duty to monitor and make subsequent recommendations. And the reason why this is so important to the claimants to try to establish a duty to monitor is that they want to use that as a check against the defense of failure to mitigate. They want to shift responsibility from the customer monitoring his account or her account and making the decision to get out of security when it's losing money. They want to shift that responsibility to the broker and to say, well, you had a continuing duty to pick up the phone and call me and tell me to get out of this stock. But as you can see from these two provisions, uh, there is no duty to monitor, and that's under the 34 Act and under FINRA uh, interpretation. The next area I wanted to talk about is 
potential liability for hold recommendations. Now, this is probably one of the most unusual and novel uh, aspects of the new suitability rules. Traditionally, a suitability recommendation only applies to a recommendation to buy or sell a security. Under the new suitability rules, it now says that the suitability rule applies to a hold recommendation. Now, when does that come up? Well, traditionally, it's going to come up in situations where your financial advisor has a quarterly review with a customer and says, I've looked at your account. I think that everything is fine. Don't take any action. Under the new rules, that's going to be determined, in many cases, to be a hold recommendation. Many firms now have a hold ticket. Many firms are now uh, adopting a hold blotter, where a financial advisor, if you have that type of conversation, then you need to document the nature of the conversation and why you told the customer to hold on to that stock. Interesting, two other points to, to remember here. The new uh, suitability rules for hold recommendations apply even for a security that the financial advisor did not initially recommend. It could be an unsolicited transaction that the customer placed in the account. It could be securities that the customer bought at another firm and transferred into the broker dealer. But if the broker makes a recommendation to hold even that unsolicited transaction, then it becomes your responsibility with respect to that particular recommendation at that point in time. Not a continuing duty, but once again, at that point in time, it is a suitability analysis that would apply to the whole recommendation. And under Fender's new rules, what's interesting, there's a disincentive now to have communication with your customers because Fender says that hold recommendations do not apply to implicit recommendations. If you're just silent, if you don't say anything to your customer at all, then that is not a hold recommendation. So what does that mean? Well, for, in many instances, financial advisors would be better off just not talking to their clients because then there would be no hold analysis. The fourth area I wanted to mention is reasonable basis suitability. Under the new suitability rules, we really have three different areas of suitability. You have customer-specific suitability, you have reasonable basis suitability, and you have quantitative suitability, which is just another uh, term for churning. Under reasonable basis suitability, where the rules say that a broker, the brokerage firm has to approve a product, has to have a product committee to look at it, make a determination that this particular product is suitable for some customer. But the rules go on to say that a stockbroker also must have an understanding of the rule. And where that is going to get into issues in arbitration is the claimants are going to say, tell me about your training for this particular product. What did the broker read? What seminars did the broker go to? What training did the broker receive? And then they cross-examine the brokers into such areas of minutia about a particular product that they will ask him or her, for instance, tell me about the default triggers on this CDO tranche that's buried inside of a mutual fund. And if the broker cannot explain all the ins and outs, no matter how removed that, uh, that issue is from the actual investment, uh, then the claimants will argue there has been a violation of reasonable basis suitability. And this applies in particular to what uh, Finner now calls the, the arena of complex products, uh, leverage exchange traded funds, REITs, uh, uh, tenant in common uh, 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 investments, structured finance, private placements. If your brokers are recommending any type of uh, product that can be considered to be complex in any respect, then you have to be, make very sure that they are being properly trained and you document that training and have it ready to produce in discovery because I can tell you this is going to be a major area of cross-examination of our financial advisors uh, going forward. So going back to John's comment that what we are in is in, in a, a knife fight, um, let me show you what Judge Rakoff from the Southern District tells us about, uh, about arbitration. Uh, in a case on a, on a decision on a motion to vacate, he says, Goldman Sachs, having voluntarily chosen to avail itself of this wondrous alternative to the rule of reason, must suffer the consequences. And that's where we are, folks. We are suffering the consequences. Good luck out there, uh, and, um, and just be careful about these new rules. Thank you.